your theory involves a, a sort of a change in the human brain. I know that you've experimented yourself with things, trying to uh, get access to different states of consciousness or what it might have been like, um, specifically with the raw food diet and the sleep deprivation type experiments. And I was wondering if you could maybe speak a bit about those and your experiences with how that changed your your brain state. Uh, well, I, I suppose it, it comes down to the idea that is, is our neural system currently more or less functional or not? Um, if not, is there any latent function? Is, is there a way to access more function? And again, but going back to these Arcadian traditions and so on and the spiritual traditions and the practices in particular, the question comes up, well, what were they trying to achieve? What, why were they... You know, for example, let's say meditation tradition or the Trappist tradition, not speaking for long, long periods or um, yeah, the tradition of trance dance, for example, you know, it's hardly new or, um, you know, using certain rhythms in music to achieve all, so-called altered states or using plant medicines to change the, bio, the neurochemistry to achieve altered states. What's going on there? Is it, is it just some random stuff or are, are we, were people trying to, just shift their state of consciousness sideways a little bit yeah. or possibly and obviously this is a question i wanted to address were these in fact practices in, in the current thinking we often have attachments to and baggage around if you step back from that i was really asking the question were these practices really treatments was this an attempt at treating a condition yeah. with varying approaches because obviously some of these approaches seem to go a long way back and some of them seem to tie in with this idea that you could access this, the lost state of the ancestors. Right. That would be one way of framing it, or certainly accessing a more functional state. And some of them, certainly to the modern eye, don't seem to make any sense. The classic, or one of the classic ones being sleep elimination or sleep deprivation, right. which, which prolonged meditation is as well. You know, people forget that if you're going to meditate for hours and hours and hours, which, which some traditions suggest, that's kind of sleep sleep deprivation, but there's some very explicit references to sleep deprivation in the sort of North American tradition, South American traditions, kind of vision quest. Yep. You yep. stay awake three, four days till you find your vision, which visual stuff tends to be not left hemisphere, right hemisphere, which we'll get to if, if it's time. Um, and it's even alluded to in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the earliest texts we currently know of. Uh, is it a metaphor? who's to say but certainly the the story generally seems to be understood as the journey of an, an the initiate in some ways trying to find this lost state of consciousness and there were various challenges and so on and one of the final challenges was to stay awake for seven days and nights um, so these these sort of tradition oh and i think also the in the buddhist tradition as far as i understand the the buddha reach some kind of altered state again after sitting meditating under the one of the sacred trees for six or seven days yeah. um, so this this pattern crops up a lot and it's just one of many so I, I got to thinking well can is it possible to to look at the commonalities in these practices or I'm going to call them treatments a can they tell me anything about the underlying condition so using those treatments as a diagnostic approach yeah. you know why would you stay awake why would you inhibit your speech why would you etc cetera, etc cetera. and then obviously beyond that how can these things be put back together in a way that might elicit some interesting um, responses or results and obviously i'm hardly unique in having that approach but um i think what was fairly unique certainly in modern times in western culture was um having changed my diet and i don't like the word diet at all um, i'm more interested in basic engineering so having changed the construction materials the fuel and even the design of my physiology particularly are including my very chemically sensitive brain um, that was part of what i was interested in because that's changed out of all recognition in you know recent times um, if having done that initial work would I get a more interesting response by bringing in some of these other approaches? And um, I became intrigued with sleep deprivation because of these accounts. And also it wasn't a prescribed activity. It's you, you're still allowed to stay awake if you want. People might think you're a bit crazy. And I thought it was something I get tested quite quickly as well. You know, it's it's not 
in principle not that difficult to to test so um yeah i started engaging in in periods without sleep and very quickly had experiences which spurred my enthusiasm they were i suppose you'd call them classic mystical experiences uh, that's one way to describe it i'd say it was sh shifting the parameters of functionality of my mind and my brain and, and most of the experiences were pretty amazing well, you spoke about, uh, i remember you speaking about your thoughts started to come to you in poetry in rhyming couplets and I remember you that, talking about that, that one that time. did happen on one occasion yes it, it wasn't sustainable but the fact it happened at all in conjunction with sleep deprivation that was quite intriguing and i do mention it in the book it was um i think it was after a period of you know one of many periods of staying awake for I mean, most of my experimentation was sort of 50, well, two days, say, to seven days. That was the window that was of interest yeah. to me. Um, and most of the interesting stuff happened around about three, four days onwards. And um, and sometimes it was a knock-on effect. You'd, I'd stay awake for uh, three, four days. Um, and it, it can be quite challenging to maintain that focus, particularly if you're on your own. Um, you, you literally only need to sit down for five minutes and the whole experiment's dead because you wake up <laughs> five, six hours later feeling absolutely dreadful, uh, which would happen quite frequently. There was quite a failure rate, but within that there were some successes. And I think it was after, I think I, I'd been, I don't remember the details, I'd been awake three, four days or something. I had fallen asleep, finally I'd sat down somewhere, not paid enough attention, woke up an hour or two later, so I had very little sleep. And from that moment on and the rest of the day, that internal voice that most of us seem to have, which again is fascinating to me because <laughs> when I ask about this, it talks, you know, uh, most people own up to having this internal dialogue and they also accept that for the most part, they wouldn't share it with their partner or their best friend, let alone anywhere else because it's it can get pretty crazy in there, <laughs> which is interesting. We have that. We all seem to have that sure. and we kind of. We go through our lives pretending it's not there or we're not going around saying, hey, fuck, they've got this mad voice in my head telling me crazy things all the time. <laughs> and, and like everybody else has got it. Uh, but anyway, um, that particular day, that verbiage was in rhyme. And, and I couldn't even not make it in rhyme. You, you know, I, I think, right, I, I want to think of something that's not in rhyme, but it would, in, in my mind, it would uh the rhyme must go because it's a show and you know it's some crazy poet <laughs> you know it was like oh my god i'm going crazy it was kind of amusing as well so yeah i mean there was a whole day where everything was in rhyme even when i didn't want it to be and i, I just, just fascinating the fact that that that's hinted at in some of these traditions that that things were written yeah communicated in in what today we call poetic and rhyme but of course these are labels for just a different a different form of communication that clearly was very effective and still is um, and I mean I had something similar not exactly the same but something similar happened very early on in the experiments with sleep where quite a lot of things happened all at once but one of the things uh, I, I, I kind of I'd been awake again for uh, about th two or three days briefly fallen asleep for maybe five or ten minutes and then woken up into quite a different state and I'd uh, felt very clumsy on my right side, kind of partial paralysis, like uh, pins and needles. Um, and I was aphasic. I couldn't speak, which might, be <laughs> enough to, which might be enough to freak you out. But I didn't feel freaked out at all. It was quite perplexing and interesting. Um, and there was no internal dialogue and so on. Um, but the, the, the correlation there with the poetry thing is uh, after about 15 minutes or so, I, I managed to find a way it was like trying to figure out how to speak again in this completely wow. different state um i got some noises out and eventually got syllables and then i could communicate with my friend who knew me well enough over the years so he knew my voice knew my syntax and it was quite different i mean there was there was a crossover there was some familiarity but um my voice was much more resonant and i was speaking much more poetically the syntax was quite reversed and quite different but very uh, still very effective and that wasn't any intention on my part i was simply trying to communicate from this very unusual state of mind and clearly something had changed and there was a completely different way of communicating that i don't normally have access to um it was very effective and felt pretty amazing felt very relaxed very easy to communicate and observed by someone else so it it, it just reinforced this idea that perhaps we have 
latent or locked away functionality yeah. that um, that in our normal state we would be blithely aware of and even quite suspicious of claims made to that end. It's like, yeah. oh yeah, sure, I can speak like this or I can do this or I can feel that. Um, well, part of my proposal is it's these states are kind of dependent on the neurochemist neurochemical regime and the degree of balance between the hemispheres if you can shift those things pretty much you will have a different experience so your money back how far you shift them will depend on the intensity of the experience and and really what the conclusion i came to is all these ancient traditions and particularly the practices were treatments designed to do exactly that right we're designed to try and inhibit the part of our mind that maybe isn't working so well anymore and simultaneously trying to stimulate the part of our mind that has a lot of this potential locked away. Um, but e even these traditions, I'd say, have become almost reductionist. You know, you, you get you get people now very attached to the meditative approach, and that's mm -hmm. enough. Or people very attached to natural diet, and that's enough. Yeah. Or people interested in the plant medicine tradition, and that's enough. And it's like, well, we're falling into the same trap here. These are just very attached, you know, yeah. single approaches. When you wind the clock back, I think, these approaches were seen more holistically. It's like, no, you, you, you do a rebuild, you put the neurochemistry back in there and the biochemistry, you then engage in these practices to inhibit what we might call the egotistical mind or the rational mind that thinks it's fully functional. And I understand that, I have one, I know what that's like. Yeah. And is not really open to the possibility that there's something much more functional that is actually quite scary because it doesn't comprehend it, because by definition it has more cognitive function, so it's a bit of an unknown. Um, but if you start putting these parameters in place, pretty quickly you get at least glimpses of something that is pretty amazing and usually feels pretty amazing as well. I mean, that's something else I've looked at are our reference points for how we feel, whether it's feeling depressed, feeling good, and so on and so forth. And going back to these ancient traditions we talked about earlier, Another common thread that came out of that, uh, and obviously it's very easy to check up on, is there's a lot of talk about our ancestors being in a, a kind of perpetual state of joy or rapture. And again, we understand those words and the concepts of those words. But what does that mean? What is, what is the experience like? You know, what, how can you feel sublime and amazing all the time? Yeah. Well, a lot of people have had glimpses of that, whether it's, you know, whether it's through their children, through sex, through use of drugs or whatever. We clearly yeah. have the wiring to feel phenomenally amazing. Yeah. Um, I was say, and yet, ben yet for the most part, we don't, you know, we're mostly stressed and frightened. Yeah. So, again, I was just looking at these patterns is, you know, did, the, did these things go hand in hand with these altered states? Was there a part of our mind wired where we'd feel pretty damned amazing and uh, we'd have a very different perception of ourselves and each other including a whole raft of experiences that currently don't mean anything yeah